Well, like many of you, when we woke up that morning uh, to hear the news that Julian Assange had sought asylum in the Ecuador Embassy, we as the Latin America Social Forum, a coalition of Latin American community groups and solidarity activists from countries such as Chile, Uruguay, Venezuela, El Salvador, Nicaragua, we knew we had to respond immediately. And there was two reasons for that. The first was because we have no doubt that Julian Assange's life is in danger. We know that we can expect nothing of this current Australian government to defend his rights. They were rushing over themselves to accuse him of being guilty. They didn't know what he was guilty of, they just knew he was already guilty. The federal police had to then tell him that actually he had committed no crime. But yet the persecution of Julian Assange by the Australian government continues. Julian knew that and he knew he had to find asylum somewhere else. We are also absolutely 100% sure that he will get no uh, help from the US government. As Latin American solidarity activists, we know of the long history of attempts to silence, assassinate, kill individuals and entire peoples that have tried to rise up against US imperialism, against the role of the US in Latin America. Military dictatorships that have come on the backs of tens of thousands of people being killed, all of them funded by the US. Why on earth wouldn't they want to get Assange? And I think Rafael Correa, in his interview with Julian Assange, summed it up very nicely as to one of the, why the US hates Assange so much. Because he raised an old story that uh, has been mentioned by other Latin American presidents. And they've asked the question, well, why is it that a military coup has never happened in the US? And the simple answer is it's because there's no US embassy in Washington. Well, when you reveal the truths of what the US embassies are doing in Latin America and all over the world, you can rest assured the US government will come for you. But we also knew as well that we have no faith in the Swedish government to do anything. And we have a very specific case study of why we do not trust the Swedish government in any way to protect the rights of Julian Assange. And I'll tell a story of a journalist, Joaquin Perez Becerra. He was a journalist in Colombia, he lived in Colombia, he was elected councillor of a left-wing group called the Patriotic Union. Because of the threat that this party represented, 4,000 of their members were killed. He went to exile. He picked Sweden as his country of exile. He has lived there for the last 20 years. He has his family there. He is a Swedish citizen. Today, this journalist is in a Colombian jail and the Swedish government is doing nothing to protect this journalist. A journalist that had to flee from Colombia and is now facing supposed charges of terrorism. What is the Swedish government doing for its own citizen? Nothing. What can we expect him to do for Julian Assange? Much less. But we also knew we had to respond, not just to defend Assange, but to defend Ecuador. Because we knew immediately, as soon as he was in the Ecuadorian embassy, that they would also use this to attack Ecuador, as they have already been doing for a number of years. And so it began in the media. The Ecuadorian government. Why would Assange pick the Ecuadorian government, which apparently has one of the worst records in regards to freedom of speech? Well, we really know when the corporate media speaks about freedom of speech, what they're really talking about is their ability to control what, we're, what is able to be said and not heard. And the Ecuadorian government has very much been leading the way in breaking down this corporate power. Yeah. When Correa came to power, six of the major um, eight newspapers were owned by banking corporations. Now, you can imagine there might be a slight conflict of interest that occurs when you both own a bank and a newspaper in the current global economic crisis but also the banking crisis that happened in Ecuador in the 90s. What did the, what did the newspapers do there? They reported nothing about the banking crisis. They in fact signed a deal, which was revealed by WikiLeaks, um, because of the US embassy cables, where these um, banking corporations and newspapers sat down and said, we will not report any of this because that way none of our interests are touched. Well, the Ecuadorian government and its people have drafted up a new constitution. In that constitution, if you're a banker, you are no longer allowed to own any media out uh, outlets. That's a pretty important start, I think, for breaking down the corporate power over the media. But that wasn't enough, because a few years later, they held another referendum to further amend the Constitution. And now the Constitution reads that anyone who is involved in the media industry are not allowed to have any other business interests anywhere else. Because, of course, once you do start to have other business interests, maybe someone like Gina Reinhardt, this is obviously <laughs> going to become an issue when you begin to report on that. 
Yep. So I think there's a very clear reason of why they want to get Assange. I think there's a very clear reason of why they're going to attack Ecuador. And I think that's why it's so important that we are here today, both to support Assange, but I do urge people to also show the support of the Ecuadorian government. Let's show them that millions of people around the world are willing to support them if they take the defiant stand of, of basically saying to the US, we don't care, we are going to defend Assange, we are going to give him asylum. We know we need to do that, we need to continue to do that, but I think we need to do one more thing as well. We need to take the lessons of governments like Ecuador and of other people around the world and use that information that WikiLeaks has made available for us to really begin to fight for real change. Because that information is only powerful when people like ourselves take that into our hands and make use of that information in order to fight for a better world. So I think that's what I want to finish off by congratulating the organisers today and congratulate everyone that's here. And let's hope that we can continue to build that campaign to defend Assange, to defend Ecuador and to fight for that better world we all want to see.